whenever the next general election is, and at this point, it is, I think, still really up in the air when the next general election really is going to be. There may be even one this year, there may be one in 2023, there may be one in 2024, there may be one in 2025. At the moment, because our entire, our entire current, shall we say, um, politics, especially around the Conservative Party, is completely up in the air, um, we generally don't know what's going to happen here. However, like some good news was that uh, this week, if there was a general election to be held uh, on that particular day, Labour would have won. Um, the Conservatives would have had a, a very significant loss. They wouldn't be holding the majority they certainly have now, but neither would Labour be able to uh, take a majority in either. In fact, by the looks of it, they would have to almost certainly form a coalition with the Lib Dems to be able to at least hold uh, some sort of power and keep the Tories out of government, which anyway is good. However, one of the key battle areas almost certainly in the next general election is going to be these red wall seats. And again, it shows you that we're still calling them red wall seats for a reason. There was much hoo-ha and fanfare after the 2019 general election coming up to the next local election that these Labour councils would also be swept away and miraculously become Conservative councils. However, that did not happen. Indeed, even more of those, um, shall we say, councillors, those, those local councillors where they had Conservative MPs, became even more Labour. Because ultimately, as we've seen and I've been constantly talking about, especially at a local level, Labour is doing really, really well in putting forward a lot of very good uh, policies following heavily upon the Preston model. And if this, again, does sweep out to the rest of the local Labour parties, there's no reason why some of these policies can't work their way up into a more national government. As I've said at the moment, at the next local election here in South Yorkshire, the Labour representative is an open socialist. He doesn't shy away from saying that he is or isn't. So. Those who are saying that Labour's no good anymore or anything like that, well, look at look at this guy. Look in, you know, South Yorkshire. Look at you know, the local councils and what they're doing. Uh, there's a lot of people just not paying attention to what's going on here. However, how do these Red Wall Yorkshire seats in particular fare today? What are they thinking about the current crises? What are their ideas and their thoughts? Some who, again, for the first time in history, have elected a a a, lay, a a conservative MP for the very first time, and it looks like they're not happy with their <laughs> with their choice. So, uh, before we do go diving into the article, please do remember to hit that like, share, and subscribe button. And of course, down below there are links to my Patreon page and our donation link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can well buy me coffee. And as always, thank you very much to all those people who do support the channel that way. So, on with today's article. These today's comes from the Yorkshire bylines with the title of Painting the Town Red. How are Yorkshire Redwall seats feeling in 2022? If you live in Yorkshire, it's hard sometimes not to feel as if though you are in the eye of the storm. A region that voted to leave the EU, that has suffered, like many, from the financial impacts of the pandemic, and now a key battleground for any forthcoming general election. So, what do voters in the red wall seats of Yorkshire make of Brexit and the politics in general some two years on from leaving the EU and the start of the pandemic? In a fascinating report published by the UK in a changing Europe last week, which attempted to try and lift the lid on what voters are thinking some two years after the last general election, in a period like no other, with two seismic events of uh, fighting an international pandemic and leaving our biggest trade bloc, the EU, collided. The report draws on the findings from Ipsos, which commissioned also to carry out reports of qualitative research investigating of the changing political landscape, specifically the individuals were drawn from the following constituencies. Wakefield, Batley and Spen, Don Valley, Bradford South, Rother Valley, Halifax, Hemworth, Normington, Pontefract and Castleford, Colne Valley, Dewsbury, Knightley, Peniston and Stocksbridge, as well as the Great Grimsby and Scunthorpe as well. The report does make for some very fascinating reading, but will be of very little comfort to either the major parties. 
If anything, it shows how much the traditional party loyalties have been completely broken and the extent of which those votes are now up for grabs. The sense that the general election of 2019 marked a break with the past was evident, and with two respondents quoted as saying this. For the North to turn completely upside down, that was a complete bombshell, said one Conservative voter. A mining community, it's always been Labour, 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 and now we've got a Conservative MP, said a Brexit party voter. The summary from the report of the Ipsos contains some very of the most revealing aspects of how these swing voters are feeling. Participants were very enthusiastic and positive about the places that they lived, and Yorkshire even more broadly, seeing Yorkshire as culturally distinctive from down south, and with connecting between different places and good community spirit as a positive aspect of living in Yorkshire. And although when it came to identity, participants were interchanged in terms of British and English. And of course, levelling up was also a confusing concept. With one Labour voter saying, it sounds like a game, like a PlayStation game. You've got to the end of one stage and you go on to the next level. I just think you'd be playing a game on a PlayStation or something. Another said, you often hear about the North-South divide, etc. From who? Probably spin doctors in the government, by the government. I think it's a bit of a sales pitch for the North vote, personally. That's what I see it as, said one Conservative male voter. Again, interesting. The big concerns obviously appeared to be around crime and drug abuse, homelessness in the cities, and the deprivation of empty buildings in the town centres. It's striking how much heat has gone out of the cons conservation around Brexit, but Brexit and the pandemic are together seen as responsible for the flood of shortage of, of flood of uh, 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 yet yeah, for the food shortages and of course the problems with the petrol shortages and perhaps of course the most worrying for both Labour and the Tories is the extent at which party affiliations have been broken. The old social contract is well and truly broken. True, there is evidence that the long-term Conservative voters are going nowhere with their party affiliation, describing the party as trustworthy or good at managing the economy. <laughs> That's laughable. But those, of course, who stitched their vote to Conservatives in 2019 showed very little attachment to the party. Curiously, respondents did not mention that the Conservatives now appeared to be more the party of the working uh, did mention that the Conservatives did now appear to be more the party of the working class, and Thatcher would have been proud. Again, that's incredibly shocking that that has become a, a thing. How on earth has that happened? That the Conservatives are now appear to be more party of the working class? Um, you cannot point to a single policy and say that is a good Conservative policy for the working class. There isn't a single one. So that's incredibly shocking and something that we definitely need to do a lot more work on here. Equally, this also does not translate into former Labour voters returning to the party. A present theme across the focus groups was a belief that Labour's economic record in office was poor and that the financial crisis of 2008 was being a focal point for criticism. Again, the financial crisis was not Labour's fault. I want to point that out. It was conservative policies from the 80s that were ultimately responsible for the financial crash, especially of 2008. And yes, the conserv the Labour government at that time does bear responsibilities for um, not bringing, especially backing banking regulation to help stop that. But ultimately, of course, the 2008 financial crash was ultimately a a wave that came from America and responsible for the their housing crash that happened there. So. Ultimately, it's not really Labour's fault at the end of the day, um, as much as you, you like to say it. But of course, there's been a lot of uh, propaganda put out about how Labour's bad for the economy. It actually wasn't. The Labour, um, again, the Labour term of government of, of again Tony Blair was actually an incredibly good period for the British economy right up to uh, 2008. And of course, this seems very acutely unfair uh, uh, to Labour, given that the global financial crisis of 13 years ago wasn't really Labour's fault. But again, that's politics. Again, I've just said why. But the bottom line is, 
that in 2021, votes are up for grabs, particularly amongst those who switched Labour to Tory in 2019. And there is no evidence of a permanent shift to the Conservatives from those voters. Neither is there evidence that they will automatically return to Labour, a sense, as the report says, of them shopping around. An interesting factor to consider is that people, again, are still unhappy with their circumstances and quality of life. But neither Labour nor Brexit are seen as the answer, as the Ipsos report notes. Their previous Labour votes had not resulted in their lives or local areas demonstrably improving, thus prompting the disillusionment and changing in voting preference. But Brexit is also not the answer as the even staunchest Leave voters who's, who's, uh, who took part in the focus groups do feel that Brexit is having negative consequences for their country's economy. This means that the Tories will have a huge problem in these seats as they can't frame it at the next election around the once popular notions of sovereignty, independence and Brexit. And it will all be about the economy, especially in the next few years. And a recent new Economics Foundation report shows that the real disposable incomes in Yorkshire and the Humber have barely risen since 2009, approximately 0.3%, with places like Wakefield, Barnsley, Doncaster, Rotherham and Hull getting a special mention for having both low productivity and very high social needs. Last year, we looked at the two bellwether seats of Knightley and Dewsbury. Labour seats lost to the Tories back in 2019. Their town centres feel hugely neglected and left behind, but after nearly 12 years in power, one cannot help point the finger at the Tories. How are the Conservatives suddenly, miraculously going to make these places feel very prosperous or even proud, or as the UK in the Changing Europe does reports, notes to hold on to those voters in those areas the Conservatives need to deliver? But it's not yet clear that they are yet understanding what that actually means. So votes are indeed up for grabs. And the political party that does manage to articulate that sense of concern and have a very clear roadmap to make things happen will be the beneficiaries. The message needs to include a credible economic package and a sense of purpose that generates pride in these communities. Labour could still do this, but they really need to get their game together sooner rather than later. And again, I sort of agree. Um, and we are seeing that at the moment. There is some interesting movements around the economic strategies. Again, I've talked about the decarbonisation of the steel industry. Again, a labour policy, which not only is good for, again, the environment, but also going to be good for these steel towns, as we've just seen very recently. Um, Liberty Steel going under threatens a load of steel jobs in these very areas which the Tories promised to protect. And again, doesn't look like many of these, again, Conservative MPs are, so we say, interested in actually protecting uh, those jobs, which, again, is an absolute win for any Labour candidate at the next general election. Just bring up their comments about how they didn't support Liberty Steel or the fact that they didn't even consider nationalisation being an option to help save these jobs, as well as a very strategically important industry for the UK. So... These votes are indeed up for grabs, and it is all about, as we have said before, time and time again, it's policy, policy, policy. It's putting forward these policies in a way that people can understand. So you've seen levelling up, catchy slogan, but really, it's got nothing to it. What Labour needs to do is not only come up with its own catchy slogan, but also have policies that are easy to understand. So decarbonisation of the steel industry saves the North steel, stay, it will save the UK steel industry. That's all you need to say. And that's what you need to get into voters' minds. And if you vote for Labour, not only do you save the UK steel industry, but you protect jobs up in the North. We've also got, again, zero hour contracts are absolute bane on many workers' lives. The Tories Every single general election have promised to do something about zero hour contracts, but every time they have done it, they have done nothing about it. So you just turn around and say, they've promised to do something about zero hour contracts. They've done nothing. They have no plan to actually deal with them. Again, turn to Europe and you've either got A, an outright ban of zero hour contracts, or you say you can have a zero hour contract, but you can only have them for up to three months before then you have to bring that. A particular employee onto a full-time contract. 
Those are two ways to do it. And Labour could go either either of those ways because I'm perfectly fine um, with those two options or ideas. So again, there's stuff there that Labour can really be doing. And I've said this right from the beginning of when Keir Starmer came in. He needs to put forward, this is what the policies of Labour are going to do. This is what we are going to say. And this is how we're going to do them. And I've said before, it would not hurt Keir Starmer to put out a Labour manifesto early. And especially now and say, this is what the Labour Party is about. This is what we would do to help run the UK. And especially post-pandemic, people are really, really going to be after change. So really going after and being daring for bold policies is a really good move for Labour if they do that. So as always, uh, thank you very much for watching. Please do remember to hit that like, share and subscribe button. And of course, down below, there are links to my Patreon page and our one link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can well buy me coffee. And as always, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you all next.